I'm Alan Kogan. Join me as I tour the country tasting different whiskeys and discussing the craft of distillation with local distillers, whiskey lovers, and even those who are new to the culture of spirits. Welcome to The Kogan Conversation. In this episode, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Michael and Lorenzo Paluzzi from Falls Church Distillers, located, of course, in Falls Church, Virginia, a father and son duo taking on the challenge of craft distilling and making uniquely delicious spirits, as well as some phenomenal canned cocktails. I had a blast as they welcomed me into their home and showcased their love for the craft. Hope you enjoy. Cheers. Well, Michael, Lorenzo, Falls Church Distilleries. I don't know what to tell you, call you guys. I can't. Fu- <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that was a thing that, you know, like everybody makes a mistake. And I jokingly say this is what's going to make us famous at the end of the day. Right. Everybody calls a <laughs> false church distillery because everybody goes by distillery. We kind of we kind of a, a bigger thought in mind when we started this and we were able to accomplish some of that. And we may get back to it as well um, in our next iteration of you know where we land and so forth. So it's actually false church distillers. Um, and we chose distillers because we were going to invite other people in. We did classrooms there. We've trained some local distillers that are just, that are opening up new distilleries, right? We have done some uh, wine, bad production of wine grapes recovery to give them uh, products that they could use for fortified wines or ports if they wanted to like not lose a whole crop. Yeah. So it was always more of a, we always wanted to be kind of different from your run-of-the-mill distillery. We always kind of wanted to like try to, reach out and be be more than that name means so not to say that's less of it we're just trying to do other things right yeah and so false church distillers yeah like a collective almost yeah that's awesome but so first of all thank you for having me here this is awesome to be in your in your home and, and talk to you both about your craft and what you do tell me a little bit of how you got into it and why you decided to get into whiskey and I just go through the motions of that because the small the, the small craft distilleries are what I'm interested in. I love the stories of these of these local distillers who are doing some great work across the country. I mean, I love talking to Jim Beam and Jack Daniels, good stuff. But they're massive corporate monsters that sometimes that TLC is lost in the in the barrel. So tell me about it. Yeah. So um, you know, I grew up culturally in uh, like upstate Pennsylvania, New York state line, that kind of area, like near the Finger Lakes and what they call the endless mountains mm-hmm. so it's just a little valley and everything not many people but a lot of italian immigrants and so like that whole like generation above or like two gener- the grandparents mm-hmm. that all immigrated I, my hometown was like 60 70 percent italian right <laughs> and so every i mean it literally was and like you know that whole generation never spoke english but they made all their own wine sure they made all their own uh what you would now call cold medicine i think it was the first iteration of, of nyquil i guess right um most people know it as Appalachian Applejack. <laughs> so we would take all those Rome apples and what you could only can so many. And then we would take and like in a teapot with a copper coil and distill it down and make brandy. Right. And so that brandy with hot water, lemon and honey and a whole lot of clothes is how you broke a fever as a kid. That was your cold medicine. It was a shot of that stuff. Sure. So I've been like around production of wine and Applejack and different things my whole life. I mean, literally got in the military. I, I was really like the great guy, because I was making all the alcohol for everybody, right? So we all we were all doing really good there. Um, but we experimented as we got, you know, always to experiment. Always had like the little um, five gallon still in the backyard. Never sold it, <laughs> but always did like different things. And we put it in other bottles and try to fool people. Go like to get an honest opinion. What do you think, right? Yeah, yeah. The problem with it was though, the way I was taught, the way I did it, no two batches ever taste the same. Sure. Because I didn't, you know, I was just like knew what I was doing. I didn't know why it was doing what I would do, you know, in reaction. So Lorenzo went to school for chemistry and that's the trick. Now we could create a repeatable flavor in the batches because we were controlling the whole process. Because, you know, it's, it's recipe, yeah. process, finish. I mean, there's all, like steps that, that create your product. So yeah, spend, spending a couple hours in a lab here and there taught you a little bit more structure for sure. But um, and originally what kind of started off my love of it was more of a social requirement uh, in a way. I was 17 when I went to college. So <laughs> nobody was gonna buy me a pack of cigarettes or a beer, right? So I figured out how to brew. I joined a little club at, at the college I went to. And um, then that that love kind of progressed as I was, you know, brewing beer, brewing wine, different things, whatever I really could grab my, get my hands on locally, which is mostly like apples and other different types of fruits. Um, but um, we, you know, in that group in, in chemistry class, you eventually learn about distillation and, you know, organic chemistry and the different processes in which 
you know, pharmacy, pharmaceutical, you know, companies leverage to create drugs and other things. And I was just really fascinated by it. But the most uh, common thing down there in Southern Virginia was moonshine. So kind of by proxy learned a lot about it. There's some local families there that, you know, I learned from and, and then came when I came back from college. I was like, look, dad, look what I made. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I like this. This is great. Yeah. So I retired from IBM. It was the right time to like maybe take a break and do something else, I guess about seven, eight years ago at this point. Um, managed to actually stay retired for four years, three three years or four years until I went back to work in industry again, like IT. But um, uh, during that time, uh, we opened up the distillery. I mean, I, I thought also that um, it was, uh, I mean, not a serious, there's a joke and it was a serious side. The joke I always told, said on a tour, right? And we do tours, but the, the serious side of it is I just trying to create um, a situation where the kids could like do something on their own if they didn't want to work for somebody else or if they wanted to like, you know, learn about business and learn about, uh, uh, you know, distribution and learn about, you know, the different things. Or if they if it became their passion, yeah. then they could follow that passion, right? Now, the joke was that when you retire, you need, you know, one of three, you need three things to be kind of locked in. You need housing. I'm good on housing, right? You need health care. I'm a vet. So I could always go back to vet and you know, get veteran health care. That's fine. And I need to cover whatever that habit is that you have, right? Whatever that, like, whether it's fast cars or fishing or hunting or whatever. For me, it's, I had to cut, figure out how to cut down on my bar tip. Yeah. Yeah. Ask my wife about my shelf at home. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so did you camp out recently for that? The most recent bottle release? I, I did. Yeah. Oh, Saturday. I, yeah. I had a feeling you'd be a camper for that one. <laughs> what'd you get? What'd you score? Uh, I got a, uh, one of, uh, Katachin Creek's new releases oh. they had. And then, uh, I got an Eagle, Eagle rare 10. Oh, nice. Just because, um, yeah. I, I hate I hate the how the market has gone. I'll ask you more about that too. But it's like you you go to D.C. and you have just over the border you have secondary market going 25, 30, 45 percent more. It's it's insane. Um, Speaking of Becky, uh, Kentucky Creek, though, Becky, I see where Becky and Scott bought themselves back. Yes, they did. That's good. I can I reached out and congratulate them. They're great people. Yeah, I just talked to them. I just talked to Becky uh, uh, a little while ago. Um, but yeah, they're they're great. That's a cool little spot they have there. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so father, son duo, is it just you two or? Well, and, and my other son is now, um, out of the military. He got out in January. So he's you know, third generation air force, right? Cool. Um, and he's back in the area now. We're kind of letting him settle back in, but yeah, he'll, he has come out and started to learn some of it and he'll be more and more involved as we go forward. Awesome. Awesome. So did, did dad just drag you in and say, Hey, you're a chemist now, or were you like jonesing to come and like take yeah, it the was, reins? It was kind of uh, I came home and this was something that I was already doing. And then I was like, Oh, we were just kind of ideating about it, playing in the backyard. And then we we're like, maybe we should actually do something more with this than just a hobby. Yeah. So that was kind of, I'd say like a little bit of me sparking it and then him having a past in it and then us playing around the backyard and not blowing ourselves up for long enough <laughs> right. that you know, we figured out, you know, hey, maybe we're actually pretty good at this. We had some friends try, you know, our apple brandy and our, our, our early recipe stuff that, you know, we've, you know, worked on for oh, probably a decade now. So it all kind of started in, you know, our minds and then got to the market eventually. That's really cool. What how, what helped you get the business acumen? How, I mean, I'm sure there's a massive learning curve other than just the actual distillate. You actually get to get into a whole new side of business that, yeah. with especially with a side of the country that has some unique laws. Yeah, yeah, well, there's all of that, right? <laughs> so, um, so a lot of those things. I mean, I've run you know some fairly good size uh, sales and federal sales practices uh, for IT companies in, okay. in my day, right? Um, but then the the last job that I had with IBM was I was actually uh, the army rep, right? And so I would uh, guess where some of the army bases are, right? And so I spent a lot of time touring the distilleries, talking to different people, coming back, we you know bounce it off each other. I actually went out to uh, Colorado and spent a week and took a class myself, and uh, then I went to a couple of. Um, I would, you know, trade shows type of thing and, st and like sat in every class, right? Uh, of those things, like, you know, American Distilling or wherever, wherever I was going to. Yeah. And so did that and built a business plan for a couple of years. I mean, it was a couple of years, just kind of plotting it out, planning it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, took out an SBA loan and That's got awesome. a couple of investors and went for it. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm in the National Guard, so I, I've been around a couple of army bases, but uh, you're right. There are a lot of... Uh, distilleries around uh, the neck of the woods because they know who they're selling to. <laughs> yeah, right, 
That's cool. Well, so what do you guys all make? What's uh, what's your what's your go to? Uh, what did you would you go into the market saying, you know what, bourbon's big right now, so let's make bourbon? Or did you want to make what you want to make and then realize, oh shit, people aren't taking that? So we had a, a kind of a unique requirement, right? Because we when we first opened, we opened up a full bar restaurant and music venue, like music venue too, okay. right? And so like we had, and it was only our liquor on the bar, other than mixers. And so we had to make products that we wouldn't necessarily have focused on mm-hmm. and going forward. And we're not really making now for bottling. It's not an ABC Great experience, thing. though. Yeah. I'm sure. So, um, so we, you know, um, we're vodka drinkers, martini drinkers. So we made a vodka and then um, we made a pepper vodka because everybody was doing it. We thought we had a unique way to do it. And so we did it. Uh, we made a gin just because we had to. Neither one of us like gin or drink gin, but we made a gin that has like got more metals than any of our other products. Wow. Because we tried to make a gin that was like everything, every kind of every one of our products has a little story and a little family and a little whatever behind it. Okay. Um, and then we uh, we found an old recipe for bourbon, um, like a Virginia kind of recipe where back when you had like one bourbon, one whiskey in your house, <laughs> right? It had a little rye in it and a little wheat. So it was, you know, you could go a couple different ways with it. Um, and uh, then ultimately we branched out and did a uh, 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 kind of like a, uh, almost like an Irish style whiskey for, you know, beer to shot type of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's kind of the product line. And we had others. We had apple brandy, apple cherry brandy. Well, uh, you know, we have, we've had like along the lines, several different things. We got a new, uh, our latest bourbon recipe. We got eight barrels of it right now. That's five years old. We're just... Uh, when we get to our next place and can open up an ABC store or whatever, we'll crack that. That's like our, that's like a whole new style based on spelt. So it's a very like yeah. different kind of uh, 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 flavor profile. I'm really right? excited about yeah. that one. It and we got some good. barrel aged gins and we got some Calvados now because, you know, I mean, COVID, the bad thing about COVID was you didn't sell a lot of bottles like of the unique stuff. Good thing about COVID is everything is now like that much older. Right. right. So, and we got all these barrels sitting there, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and so, and, and so, yeah, so we used to make a lot of things, but what we drink mostly of here in the house, interestingly enough, is probably rum, which we dabble in. We dabbled in. Uh, bourbon for sure and whiskeys. I mean, I mean, you can see this bar here is all rum and different things. The bar behind you is all whiskeys and bourbons. And that bar is all tequilas. Oh, wow. But when we tried to experiment and make tequila, um, it just didn't, there wasn't a profit model for making good product available not, safely not for the states. You right. gotta be rich enough to move to Mexico and buy a, a farm, right? An agave farm. And we don't, we don't have that kind of cash. One day, right? <laughs> We're not the, really the, the root of that question, right? Really, our, probably our biggest passions are around the aged products. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the aged brandies, I think, are like near and dear to both of our hearts. It's flavors that we love, but we both love bourbon deeply. And that's really where we, you know, we started our mission was mostly around that bourbon. Um, you know, it's it's relatively young, but it's not super young. It's still got like you know, well-aged flavor for, you know, four years to five years in a barrel. Um, and then that younger whiskey that's, you know, touches the bourbon barrels and it gets a little bit of that love and it's nice and young and fun to shoot. So I'd say those are probably like the four core products. Well, but, you know, know. Yeah, now we're leaning into the RTDs obviously yeah. very heavily because it's, we learned that, I mean, that was a byproduct of COVID, right? We started um, like trying to create different things on the back bar. And so we, were, we started like pre-mixing drinks and kegging them. Yeah. On the bar with the beers, right? On, on the back bar. Um, and then from there, people wanted them delivered to their homes and you can't, you know, so we were like doing cocktails to go and like the adult Capri Sun baggies you can <laughs> buy off of Amazon really with straws. We were like delivering like hundreds to like apartment buildings and stuff. And it just took off ridiculous. We struggled for a while on how to, um, by not, by all natural means, creating a stable product that could sit in the can and get hot and not blow up. Right. Right. Because we're using fresh juices. We didn't want to add like a lot of additives. I mean, we, we didn't want to do like sulfites or anything that even wine has to do. Right. We didn't right. want to do any of that. Right. And so it took us a while to, to figure that out. Plus the canning laws and all the other things that are unique to Virginia that are a lot of fun. So we ultimately found a, a company in Pennsylvania now that is like canning this for us because oh, wow. that law is slightly different. And it's all legal stuff. But, you know, and uh, starting to introduce them here in the States just in this last month. Oh yeah, all craft liquors, no added preservatives or sweeteners. So all natural juices. Um, and then, you know, the, the bourbon lemonade is a nitrous can, which is really fun. And then we have the carbonated tart cherry mule. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as the conversation progresses. Well, I should drink them. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm excited for that part. Well, I guess I, guess I should ask you that what, you're the experts, it's your, it's, your, it's your product. What would be the best way to start? 
So I think that honestly, what we normally start is like give you a taste of the vodka, give you a taste of the pepper vodka, give you a taste of the gin, give you a taste of the whiskey, give you a taste of the bourbon, right? And then go to the RTDs because they're refreshing, kind of yeah. like cleanse your palate and put in there seven point five percent. So, so yeah, if you want to, we'll yeah, just it's rolling. Taste. Taste. Well, I, uh, I might start drinking this one because it's going to get watered down. Okay, and I like this one a lot. So. Uh, <laughs> I'll uh, get you another glass. <laughs> and I'll get you a, a, a spirit glass. But yeah, so I'll put out a couple of glasses for you. Cool. And we'll get going. So, um, what do you normally drink? Yeah, I'm a big bourbon and scotch guy. I, uh, I would say scotch is my number one. Um, I was introduced by, uh, to scotch by a lot of friends who were dabbling in, 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 you know, sourcing some rare bottles and say, hey, try this. Hey, try this. And, you know, it's like we've all had that one scotch or that one bourbon when it's like, yeah. and it's just it's just whiskey. It tastes alcoholic, but it's like, well, you haven't been opened up. So I. I've now been open in the last like six or seven years, been w- opened my mind to a lot of different things. And that's what one of the part of the reason I'm doing this journey is going around and talk, talk to craft distillers who are making really unique product. Like this bourbon tastes like a bourbon I've never had before. This bourbon tastes more like a rye. This rye tastes like a scotch. What, what the hell are you doing? Um, but yeah, I, I'm a big peated scotch guy. I love the peat. Um, the smoky flavor. The smoky flavors. I love that. I love a toasted bourbon uh, with a higher char, like maybe a number four char barrel. Uh, and then I know, uh, I think it's Copper Fox. They throw in some toasted chips in their stuff and makes it even more wooded flavor. I love that stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think scotch number one, bourbon number two, and I'm, I'm rarely you drinking. You like the palate carpet bomb. Yes. Yeah. I, my, my mouth is destroyed from all the flavors. <laughs> well, yeah, scotch, scotch is um, tricky, right? I mean, because it's gone through, historically, it's gone through some iterations because of the barrel yeah. issues, right? The Spanish Civil War and all that, and sherry barrels, and yep, yep. used American bourbon barrels and everything else. And it's, you know, so I, I, I his typically find... I'll enjoy a scotch if it's like kind of at least 12 years in the barrel. Sure. Right? I mean, the longer the barrel, the better it is. With, with one exception, like the uh, the Dalmar Cigar Malt. Yes. Oh, so good. With a, with a cigar, too. I mean, I mean, it's like, it's like, how did they do that? That's creative, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, I will do that. I will drink. I always have a bottle of that around just for a cigar, right? Yep. Yep. I'm, I should say that, too. I'm a big cigar guy, too. So I, I actually have a, a group of friends who are, we're all uh, military, either active or retired, but we're, uh, I shouldn't say retired, but out. But, um... And we all uh, drink cigar or drink bourbon, enjoy cigars, and the Delmore comes up every year. We have a friendsgiving. We none of us. We all live away from home, so we go and get together for Thanksgiving in the on the East Coast. You just made the next invite list for our cigar nights. So. <laughs> well, that'd be phenomenal. Yeah, we do the front porch quite often. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, and I, I think I'll be we'll be doing an industry one in January, which will be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what I've poured for you thus far, um, left to right, is our vodka and then the the pepper vodka. So really, the only two okay. difference the only differences between the two is that. You know, same product, same process, but the um, the pepper vodka is it's like a natural tea steep. So we drop like, you know, fresh and dried um, uh, pepperoncini peppers and then a little bit of serrano pepper to actually give it some heat. Okay. The vodka itself is 50 percent wheat, 50 percent cane. And then um, we really targeting more of like that sort of Russian style vodka where it's really sippable, really smooth kind of sweet finish kind of syrupy naturally um but yeah the 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 key difference on a good vodka at least in my opinion what i've done my research on is in the filtration post post distillation is filtration is the biggest differentiator in terms of the quality oh it's very good it's almost like a buttery mouth feel Mm -hmm. yeah so we're really going like yeah i can go with a martini nothing wrong in a martini but i also want to just sometimes pour a glass out of the freezer and drink it right and um, I want some flavor to it. I want a profile to it. It does limit on, on the kind of the cocktails you can make with it. Sometimes you got to like, you can't go to so much like a, a, a something sweeter, like an orange juice in it. It's going to be awfully sweet, right? Right, right. But you can certainly do like cranberry and you can and, and tart cherry like we've done um, and pomegranate juice like we've done in the RTDs, right? Sure, sure. Wow. That's very good. Um, yeah, wasn't there a, a, a recent law in the United States that, that, there was it used to have to be flavorless and now that's been repealed so t- technically that's i don't know if that's been repealed or if it's changed but the original definition of a vodka was something that's odorless and flavorless it can be made from literally anything that produces some form of sugar okay right so you know some sort of polysaccharide or whatever that you're breaking down into a sugar so as long as you're taking it above what is it, 180 proof it's considered flavorless Oh, um, so it, it, it's as it's coming off the still, I believe. Now I, I could be wrong, but that's my, that's how my memory. This, this does just just a comment on that. This comes off at like ninety five percent alcohol. Mm-hmm. 
So, is what we're starting. So it's well within that range of odorless, flavorless, but I think you're, 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 the, that's kind of like a silly thing to call it because it, the base grain that you use will have some residual flavor. Of course. Right. Well, it's just so you can drink it at work and get away with it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I, mean, then, I think the goal is that, right? <laughs> so you take the same vodka and then you do the steep of... Yep. Yeah, so yeah, at, at, cheating you can't not at truth. Right. So so not like what we're what we're bottling at, but actually at the like as it comes off the still. So what you would call like barrel yeah, strength, right, but, right. but way above barrel strength. So it's you know, really sitting there for a couple weeks. It's about I think it's what 190 proof yeah. is where we start, and then we do the steep at 190, and then we uh, proof it down to bottle strength. So obviously going to work in a Bloody Mary. I was going to say, this would be perfect. Yeah, it works in a Bloody Mary because it's a lot of flavor and the spice, not heat. So you yes. now, now you heat to your taste buds, right? In case like that, like some of the black pepper stuff. And, and not, you know, that works for some people, but it's like when you're serving a meal at the table, let them season it at the table to finish. You, you got to start somewhere that is going right. to work acceptable. For me, I actually, this is, um, I like to, in summertime, I like to make a martini out of it. Mm. In the wintertime, I put it in my hot chocolate. I can see that. I love it, and I'm I'm not the biggest like like a, 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 a heavily flavored habanero is probably my limit on all on a spice, and that's on a day that I feel up to it. Um, and I've had some infused vodkas that are just just want to kick you in the mouth for no reason. It's a gimmick at the bar, um, but this this is a, like a sweet heat that doesn't offend you, and it'll be perfectly like in a coffee. I love that idea. Yeah, and yeah, so, or, a so, yeah. or a hot chocolate, yeah. And what and what should be happening in your mouth right now? Because again, remember we had this restaurant that we opened up, right? And so a lot of these things are also to tend to build a business and to support the other sides of the business. Your mouth should be like salivating right now pretty heavily. Yeah. Well, that means you're you're going to be hungrier. <laughs> you're going to eat. You're going to taste more of the flavors of the mood because that's the saliva that does that. So it was all kind of I, I can't say you know there's some prescription to our madness. <laughs> sure. Not smart. It's smart. What do you, I know you said you guys are, are primarily vodka drinkers or started out as vodka drinkers. It, was this your, your pet project when you first started? Um, I don't know. I wouldn't say no. No. Um, okay. I think, I think our pet project is and always probably will be the apple brandy. Yeah. Well, yeah, probably. Cause that's uh, like the oldest recipe. Th this is sure. This is also the easiest thing to make. Oh yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> and it, it, it has a large appeal. So it was yeah. like, yeah, this is like low cost. This is, you know, all those things, right? To get a quality product to the market that, you know, would be sippable, enjoyable in multiple different modalities and would reach a broad audience. So, but, you know, obviously when you're in a business, you're doing multiple different things. You're trying to expect, you're trying to understand what the market wants by putting something out there and then learning from that and doing it in an iterative step, an iterative process. Right. But yeah, vodka was like kind of, we know we could use it as a base for a lot of different things, like the gin, like yep. what you're about to try. Um, and then that would allow us to have like a really simple thing to reach a broad audience while we worked on our more expensive, more like high end products for really our palates. Right. Right. Um, and hopefully those palates trend, you know, <laughs> translate <laughs> to other people as I, well. I will say this. Uh, the vodka final recipe was probably the longest recipe development cycle that we've ever had. <laughs> Well, we thought was the easiest. <laughs> <laughs> so we we distilled so many different sources and blended at different levels. And to say, okay, we came up with fifty percent wheat, fifty percent corn. I mean, it's like, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you, know, you get to this simple kind of end, but it took us weeks. Sure. And I mean, it was probably the longest of our of our product development cycles that we yeah. that wow. we had. Yeah. You wouldn't. I wouldn't have never guessed that. And it was like yeah. it was also <laughs> it was also like right at the rise of Tito's. Oh so, sure. And that was you know corn. And so we were like, oh, what could we do that's different than corn? And so we did sugar cane and wheat. So it gave a little of that whiskey flavor, that weeded whiskey flavor, but really like got that soft like rums or sweetness. Yeah. It's really well, we, nice. Well, we started out with all wheat because we were trying we to do like a, with we were wheat. trying to yeah. do like a Russo standard, a Russian standard. Oh sure. So we were trying to like kind of do that kind of flavor, and that's a, a wheat based vodka. Yep. And so we started there, but we couldn't like so many things. What we could do with our still, with our processes, with our yeast, with whatever, we couldn't get there to that flavor profile until we started adding in. Some sugar cake, right? Right. Yeah. right. That's what we got to that profile. Yeah. But that was the profile we were targeting. Yeah. Just like yeah. with our whiskey, we were targeting like that Irish kind of Jameson profile. Sure. Yeah. And, and we it ended up having like next to nothing of what Jameson has in their product to get there. So <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Which is funny. I don't know how it happens, but yeah, that's 
the universe working for you. So jumping from the two vodkas. We have a gin. We have a gin. Same base spirit. Right. No filtration. Uh, however, all of the flavors. So uh, this is more like the, the Dutch style gin. Mm. None of it goes into the pot. It's all done through steam infusion. Oh. So we, we have a, a gin basket that's down the line in our in our still that actually goes through and that's where the steam picks up the flavoring. Yeah, there's some redistillation that happens within that pot uh, yeah. naturally, but um, you don't get the same level of, it's like a bitterness from, and the juniper, they're much softer notes mm. because of that. So like, if you're not a big gin drinker, this might actually be a gin that fits into your profile because it's gonna be more floral. It's going to be more uh, citrusy. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that after you give it a try. But it's definitely a different take, more modern age gin. Oh, yeah, that's not a gin to me at all. And that's good. I'm not a gin guy. <laughs> so this we, is our happy we first, <laughs> we first, yeah, We first started marketing this as like the gin for people that don't like gin. But then we found out that people that like gin liked it too. So we just said it's a gin. <laughs> it's gin. It's just gin. It's gin. <laughs> and, by all, and by all metrics, it is a gin because it's still, you know, over 51% juniper in the basket. Um, but it's really simple. Um, it's only six ingredients other than, you know, the base grain. Um, I know a lot of, uh, I've heard a lot of horror stories from distilleries who, using their same still that they're using they're making their whiskeys and their vodkas in to then make their gin and they have to scrape out and clean and like strip the inside of the still because of all the herbs and things you put in there and with that process you're talking about that doesn't happen well yeah our still is completely modular yeah, yeah. That's so you awesome. can turn on and off different features the columns or the pot but, or the or the actual gin basket yeah uh -huh. i think in this particular case so that's true but I think just the point is that like none of the herbs go into the pot. Yeah. They yeah. all go to a steam basket down the line, right? Right. Um, and that's the Dutch style. It minimizes the, that Christmas tree effect, right? That, that heavy, heavy. And some people do like their, their uh, another American or, or British kind of style, common styles, or to put just the juniper berries in the pot still and then put the herbs in an herb basket. We just did, there's two things here that are very Dutch style. One is that everything goes into your basket, and the other is that final taste on your on your tongue right there in your mouth right now, anise. Yes, and that's also Dutch, right? And those are the two. Those are two kind of Dutch signatures. Um, and and um, we ended up going to that to like look at different things. And then he would, and look, I was living in Holland when Lorenzo was born, and so he was born in Holland. So it just kind of like all made sense for us to run down that that road. Yeah, but I told you like little stories behind yeah, almost everything, uh, right? Uh, um, and so. That was part of it. The other thing that um, is unique about this, I don't think a lot of, like, I, I don't know, I've never read about it. We just decided to try it because, again, we had a kitchen, right? So we're kind of culinary, right, you know, and right. Italians, you know, food is love. I mean, so it's like, <laughs> it's, you're, in, you're sitting in my kitchen now, I mean, of course, right? So, um, so uh, it's, uh, we use binding herbs in here, too. Uh, we used uh, uh, coriander seed and angelica root, angelica root which... You call them bind. They're called binding herbs because they like keep flavors separate. Mm. So when you're like spice up meats or different dishes, they'll keep the flavor separate. So hopefully, what you got was kind of a rolling effect. You got that. You got the grapefruit right up front. Yep. Right, and then you got the tea, the chamomile, and the elderflower. Right, and then you finished with the anise. It was kind of a rolling thing, not like an all bunched up thing. And that's the, that's the binding. That's the binding uh, herbs to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it 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 took my brain a second to catch up to the anise. I love anise. I love I love that flavor profile. I know a lot of people who don't. Yeah, this I think this but is this is low enough. Yeah, it's it's light enough. This is the the other thing with all the clear products. Awesome. Thank you, I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, another thing with all the clear products is they're really often used in cocktails. Kind of like this is like um, sort of a tenant of all of our products. Is yeah. We want them to have their own natural sweetness so they can stand up in a cocktail and you don't have to add too much syrup. Sure. So we were like conscious of like, yeah, we're, the market is trending in this direction, low calorie, low sweetener. So why don't, why, why, won't, why shouldn't our liquor, our spirits actually carry a little bit of that natural sweetness with no added sugar? So that way they can support that that modern cocktail like that's lower on the sweetness. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, that's a win. That's a see as as someone who does not like gin at all. I was uh, I was yeah. I was raised on you know beef eater and that's just I don't want to drink pine salt. No, no hate by the way for yeah. anyone that likes that stuff. But yeah, no. I well, I, and that's I think that's part of the kind of the fun part too is that you know white your white spirits pay the bills, if, especially when you're starting out. You well, the, the first off, you don't have to age them. 
And so, right. so the margins are automatically better. Yeah. Right. And you're probably using simpler grain sources and, and, and bigger batches of the grains. So you're getting better cost effectiveness out of that. I mean, so yeah, everything about it. Right. Right. Everything about it. Very cool. Now, this is the whiskey? Yes, did whiskey first. So six months in a used bourbon barrel. Okay. Slightly closer, different. Closer to a year. Slightly, yeah, okay, closer to a year. Slightly uh, different grain bill. Um, but it's it's mostly, what is it? It's mostly it's corn 50, and wheat. It's 50% wheat, so it's not 51. No, I'm sorry, 50% corn. So you, it's not 51. So because that, we use a used barrel, you can't call it a bourbon. Right. Right. Those right. two things alone. Um, and it's uh, 25% um, corn and, oh my God, 25%, no, 51%, 50% corn, 25% wheat, and 25%, help me. It was 50-50. It was 60-40. It was, that was my my memory. Okay. But, um, <laughs> Been a while since I made the recipe, I guess. Yeah. I, I, so I know with the, the bourbon, it's three different, right? It's yeah. it's 62% corn, 30% or 30% malt of barley, and 8% rye. Ah, that's so it. The barley. You're We're missing the barley. Oh right? yeah. Okay. So it's and 25 barley, 25 wheat. Yes. And okay. then 50% corn. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's um, so, so yeah, it's going to be more of, it, it's, it's going to taste a lot like an Irish whiskey. I mean, like so, that's what I mean, but I don't want to like impose that thought, but that's, it was supposed to be more of a shooter, no, more no, of a fun. No, we do charcoal filter this on the end as well. Oh, like okay. we do the vodka. So this is going to be, we went for a smoother, honestly, I mean, not to, not to disparage, but we went for like a smoother Jameson was actually helped, and we wanted the Jameson price point and that's what we were going for. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a much more mellow Jameson. But it has that kind of, it has that. Yeah. It had, definitely is an, I feels like an Irish whiskey. You blindfold me. I'd probably tell you this is Irish whiskey. Oh, it's good though. It's not, what's the proof on this? 80. 80? Oh, All these products are 80. Yep. I mean, not in a barrel. That's like 104 in a barrel. Mm -hmm. 100, 300. Yeah, it is the lowest reason. proof in barrel of all of our products. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, because the bourbon is like 121 to 124. That's like usually somewhere in the 101 to 104 range. Okay. So what's the uh, familial story on this one? We just like to drink. <laughs> it's the best answer. <laughs> yeah, right, sorry. Nothing special about that. We, you know, we just say, can a couple of times, we did a Dutch gin. Can we do an Irish whiskey? Can the Italian soccer pull that off? So it was, it was, it was, that, it was a good challenge, right? Well, you succeeded in it. Jameson's a good, a good uh, yeah, aspiration. Yeah, Jameson, Red Breast, right in that area. That's what we're trying for, right? Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah, I'm a big fan of their, their 12 cast Oh my God, yeah. 12 we, we were going there. No. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah, that's hard to touch. Um, but yeah, that's that's just, you know, lower price point, easier yeah. drinking, more broad appeal than, you know, some people really don't like bourbon. But Right. Yeah. And you, you know that that's like being a scotch drinker, so. Yeah. Well, so I know we're getting to the age of things. So ha was this a bit of a trial and error to figure out what that sweet spot was for in the barrel? Is it like, hey, eight months is uh, and then over a year is a little too much well, it, was, it was you know, because we were going to because of the blending because of the charcoal filtering and because of the you know it was already going to have that bourbon mash kind of feel and taste of the barrel and everything we kind of the, the aging wasn't as important here i mean when you get to the right color on the, i mean aging usually is about flavor and color but if it's and that's kind of the issue with some of the scotch issues right it's like that barrel's been used up. The chemistry interaction takes longer now. You can't, you know, four or five or six or seven or eight years. If there's burning there for eight years, it's probably going to take 16 years to like do something interesting to a scotch, right? Because it's got to do it. But this was a case where it was more about like the coloration than the flavoring that was because we were going to smooth a lot of that out with the charcoal filtering on the end anyway. Yeah. I mean, it was just going to happen, right? Yeah. The bourbon doesn't get that. The bourbon doesn't get that charcoal filter on the end, right? It right. just kind of comes out and it's different. And that's like a recipe that we found. Okay. It's an old like Virginia, as near as we can tell, mm. an old Virginia recipe for when you had one whiskey in the house and it had to do everything, <laughs> right? You had to be able to drink it straight. You had to be able to, to um, make a cocktail out of it. And sure. those are two different products, right? Right. Because normally you make a cocktail out of rye to get that spice to offset the sweet of the juices or whatever. That's right. And you don't do, you know, that's why you don't use a lot of like, you know, sour mash or, or corn based bourbons to do that. Right. Um, so this is actually um, got 8% rye in it for that little kind of little like spice plate on the end that you yeah. can make a cocktail out of it. But, well, but in every other sense, it qualifies as a bourbon. And okay. this is three, four years typically in the barrel. Okay. And we're doing um, 
We're doing uh, heavy toast, medium char. Okay. All right, barrels. Cool. I will. I will say before I I, I try this one, the 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 whiskey that that is that you modeled after Jameson is is I think it's a perfectly non complex approachable whiskey for people who don't like whiskey. I could give this to one of my friends who don't like whiskey because all these like Ugh. it's like it's not high enough. It doesn't have that ethanol taste to it. It's not high in barrel char. It's just an approachable sweet whiskey that. I would uh, I would say I would do a side by side with Jameson, but I, I have a I'm biased against Jameson because of college. So. Uh, yeah, that was true. <laughs> well, that's, that, I feel the same way, man. It was it was that or what was it? Makers is pretty common. I could afford any whiskey. Yeah, college. I was thinking like Jim Beam, Farm Beam, after though, I, think, <laughs> I think really Jim Beam ruined my whiskey flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, you know, that's just like a sugar bomb. Right. Yeah. No. But so that that's that's great as a as a non complex approachable introductory with whiskey for someone who would never try it. But for bourbon, I would assume this is a little bit more complex. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> you said it's eight percent rye. Yes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's eight percent. It's got just that touch of rye in it on the back end. You should have just a little spice tail on it. And it, it might actually resemble a little bit of a scotch with no smoke, because it's pretty heavy on the on the malted barley. The barley. It is malted barley. Yeah. yeah. There you go. It's yeah. It's, yeah. It's got that malt flavor. Yep. Ooh, I like that. Very versatile, mm. very versatile product, very palatable. You say scotch, and I immediately think, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's just no smoke. So, yeah, yeah so, yeah. you know, the smoke, you know, smoked old fashioned, everybody does that. Right? <laughs> I mean, I, it was, we were doing that, like, at the very, right, we would take barrel staves and yep. use them and, like, you know, and, and smoke it. But that, you know, people go, like, people would come up. When I was behind a bar and I go like, "Do you have any scotch?" I go, "No, but I can make you think I do." Right? <laughs> and I would like smoke the glass and pour the whiskey in the gla- pour this bourbon in that glass, yeah. and they would go, "Yeah, it feels like I'm drinking scotch." Yeah, yeah. The, the, it's not grassy or smoky, but it's got the base of what most of a scotch is. Right. Is it? Are you just meeting that minimum requirement for uh, for corn for bourbon, or are you? I think sixty percent. Sixty percent. Okay. Uh, 60, 32 at uh, multi barley and and uh, and eight okay. percent uh, rye. That's a lot of barley for a bourbon. That's awesome. That's unique. Wow. Well, now I gotta ask, what's your favorite? Um. So, I drink probably of this. I drink majority. I drink is the whiskey and the vodka. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, yeah, I will have the bourbon, but I think I'm not a big cocktail person. I'm more of a straight person and I actually like the bite of a whiskey. Yeah. Same. Sometimes I like the bite of a whiskey, right? Versus the smoothness of a bourbon. Yeah. And so I, I will drink our bourbon and I do drink our bourbon, but I have a tendency to drink a lot more of the whiskey. Gotcha. What about you? What's your favorite? What's your lemonade. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the RT, <laughs> yeah, the RT. So, it's so, like, so, yeah, yeah, I was, I was, well, that is the bourbon. But <laughs> so, uh, probably for me, like what I drink the most of, um, it kind of goes between uh, the bourbon and the gin, which I never thought would be the case, but I just really like the gin and cocktails. It's really great in the cocktail. Yeah. Um, it's good with juice. It's good and uh, like you know, straight up like in a dirty martini, even because it makes it even more new. Those are the two ways I enjoy that. But the bourbon is probably the go-to spirit product. Very cool. I think I think I'll say the one that surprised me the most was the gin, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just no, mean no, it, no. it caught me off guard. Like, ooh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, like I might actually try that. <laughs> you know, it's funny because it's like uh, people. You're being very polite, and I get that. And I appreciate that. But like, it's all terrible. People, yeah, people come in, people come in a bar and they like. You just, Hell, you can see their face and you go like, it's okay. If there was like one product that we could make one way that everybody would want to drink, we'd all just make that product. Of course. So, I mean, and we'd all ask people to have that same palate that day. So you'd have to like, had to sit right in the amount of sleep with the, your breakfast, dinner, and lunch had to be, the, I mean, you have to, you develop a chemistry yeah. throughout the day. So products you like one day, you may not like, it may not taste the best the next day, right? Oh, for sure. Well, I've had a couple of friends and family who, you know, since I've been doing this, talking to craft distilleries, they, they, they all ask me like, well, you you know, you talk to these guys and you try their stuff and, you know, you seem to enjoy it. Um, are there any ones that you haven't liked and t- told them? And I said, honestly, what and might be a little bit of a, a recency bias or just or, or just, I don't know, bias because I'm here and talking to you guys. But also part of the, the and you saw that for us as dog, so I don't blame you. For being <laughs> cautious. But part of it is that I, I get to talk to you about your craft and it's something that you made. And it's it's a little got a little, a little TLC and, and, and you know, hands on 
right. intimate pride that's yeah. part of it. So yeah, there's a little bit of that, that yeah, that makes it taste better in my mind. But if I was gonna go like compare every craft distillery to itself and whatever, and it's like, well, okay, there might be one that I like, I wouldn't order that compared to this one or whatever. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that you know, there's a ranking. It does, it's, it's not gonna sit on your shelf. Yeah, now, I, you it's know. It's time, I, the part on the shelf, I get it. If you serve me a, a shot of Malort, if you've ever had Malort, I have Oh, this is education moment. Great. So I'm from the Midwest. In Chicago, there's this place called Jepson's. They're really old. And they make this, uh, it's a, they call it a, a, a root-based liqueur. Okay. And it tastes like absolute dog shit. And it, dry, right. it dries out your mouth and it makes you go, uh, it makes a face. And uh, they also make a bourbon that's actually pretty good. But their their little trick of the trade is this is your shot at the bar if you if you lose a uh, a round of bar dice or you you know whatever you lose a bet you pour a glass of malort and you shoot it and it's disgusting and that's why they made it. It sounds like Italian grappa. It, 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 it yeah. Well, grappa is it's really good. Oh. Grappa is not growing their own wines. Well, it's a whole different well, trade, it's, right? It's like the spent grape and the stems and the seeds. It used to be. Yeah. Now there's now it's, yeah. the grape, right? I mean, so that's like coming along with the original grappa, yeah. Uh, I was bitter. So we are, we're going to transition into the RTDs, the ready to drink cocktails. These are seven and a half percent, so they qualify as a wine in Virginia, right? You oh. can see that, you know, we're leaning in on the uh, military's themes here, right. right? And uh, the labels. Yes. So the first one, um, I'd say just because of the, the flavor, um, yeah, I would say go lemonade. Yeah, go lemonade. We're gonna do so. This is uh, this is uh, bourbon whiskey. Okay, my, my favorite. And lemonade and um, and uh, a little uh, 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 raw sugar. So yeah, we use demerara sugar. There's a slight bit of thyme extract as well in there. Um, very very subtle, and then it's mostly just lemon forward and a little bit. Of and that's a nitrous. Sugar. That's not a you know that's not a full bubble, right? No, that's so, a it's like a like a Guinness nitrous. Well, that's refreshing. All right. And dangerous. Yeah. Seven and a half percent, right? Yeah. So this one, this other one is a tart cherry mule. Okay. So this is vodka, uh, tart cherry juice, pomegranate juice, and lime. Okay. So kind of like a mule, right? Yeah. Again, seven and a half percent. But yeah, like a modern take on a mule. Oh. That's just like a mule. Right. Yeah. Also, also dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the point of the the serving size and the, like the ABV percentage is that you know they come in four packs, and so it's really the ideal scenario is you got somebody to share each one of them with yep. on on the rocks, and that way you have you know two cocktails a can, and so you get eight cocktails out of a four pack, and so it's supposed to be craft, and you know you're supposed to have that feeling like oh I went to a bar and had an actual not like. Not like a high noon or a white claw, right. like where I'm like, I'm just getting drunk. You know? yeah. Like, no, this is like, this is actually like a craft cocktail. You might even be able to use it in additional craft cocktails if you're really like intuitive about that stuff. Yeah. We wanted to give like really like that sort of um, that baseline for everybody that doesn't know how to make cocktail at home. Now, sure. one day I was sitting out on a patio. We did COVID, you did everybody's bar, you blew out into the parking lot, right? <laughs> and so I was sitting in the patio and I, I'm about my third lemonade. And I had about a half a glass in there and I went, I can't drink any more lemonade, right? So I gave it to the bartender and I said like, you know, just fill it up with a tart cherry. Just fill it up with tart cherry. I mean, I don't know. Just do that, right? And it came out and I it's drank it. And I was like, spot. <laughs> it was really good. And so I passed it around to everybody at the table. Everybody loved it, right? And so one person says, well, you got to call that a uh, an Arnie Palmer. And I said, no. And somebody else at the table says, well, you know what? There's, there's alcohol in it, so you got to call it a John Dalen. And then somebody <laughs> else at the table said, well, you should name it after yourself. So we call this a bad golfer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great tip of the hat. Oh, that's like a that's a black and tan moment right there. And that, uh, that's that's that that's my favorite we're gonna drink of at this point. Yeah. So do you, do you have a variety pack or do I have to buy two four packs and mix them all together yeah, myself? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good marketing. <laughs> now you gotta get two packs, but um, yeah, that that was a that was a happy mistake. Oh, Another good. happy mistake that we've made. So wow, yeah, that's cool. That those aren't alcoholic at all. No, they're not. I mean, they're not. That's where the danger comes in, right? Right. Well, they're right. also on ice, 
Yep. Um, so that's that's going to change a little bit of it by themselves. They they have almost zero alcohol flavor. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. You might get a little burn. You, know, you might get a little. Oak, you might get a little oakiness if you tried the vodka straight or the sorry the bourbon lemonade right out of the can. Okay. Um, chill. You might get a slight oakiness, just like you're like having some something with bourbon in it, but you won't really taste the, the actual spirit itself. Right. That's cool. I love that idea too. And I mean, the branding's cool and that you're using your own spirits that you distill and put in a bottle. You're like, hey, we're going to take that, we'll put it in a can, make a craft cocktail. That's awesome. Well, yeah, we, I mean, it's, these are the these are the exact cocktails that were behind our bar that we kegged every day fresh yeah. for our customers. And they, one of them was um, an employee's recipe, uh, Jim Commando. And he made us that brown, yeah, he, the yeah, brown so sugar time lemonade. He told us we could use it. He uh, he actually was a, uh, a bartender up in New York City and won a best drink contest with this formula at a time. And he told, and then he showed us how to make it, and he said we could use it. So wow, yeah. This the tart cherry mule actually I concocted that on, as a gin drink initially because it was me trying to figure out how to drink our gin. <laughs> And so I had to cover it up with as many different kind of like strong flavors as I could. Sure. So I came up with this recipe to do that. Gotcha. Right. And then, I, then when we, we realized that like commercialization of it, it would like be a lot more acceptable to be a vodka base. Yeah. That's when we converted to a vodka base. Oh. Because people just in their head go, I'm not going to try that because I don't like gin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see a lot of people say I'm like right. a very polarizing cocktail, right? Of course. If we so. ever do a gin cocktail in a can, we might just say flavored vodka. <laughs> <laughs> just so that we don't like, but we'll just kind of sneak it in there. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know. I guess I have to be biased towards the tart cherry because it does say Army Strong on it, right? It does. Sorry, you're Air Force guys. Yeah, you know, <laughs> So, so, I mean, but if you notice, so we have two more uh, labels designed as well for the next two cocktails. We just haven't figured out the recipes yet. We're using pit-up girls. Yeah, I love We're it. We're using, you know, girls of all different nationalities and, and different uh, branches as well. So we have, you know, here you see, uh, you actually see like the Air Force, the early Air Force, which is Army Air Corps, right. which was my dad. Very cool. Um, and we use the African woman because I served, my first permanent duty station in the Air Force was under the first uh, black four-star general. Wow. So this is a nod to my to my history. My dad, me, my son, you know, so this is a nod to all of that. Neat. Um, the Army was just like, yeah, we just like had some buddies who were in the Army and asked them, and they said this, and so we went there. And, <laughs> um, and I, I don't, I'm not even sure, but we have like a Navy and a Marine one still to use. And I guess at the time when we designed all these, Space Force wasn't Space Force yet. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how, what we would do with Space Force. Maybe put like Yoda on it or something. Yeah, like a uh, Neil Armstrong or something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what cocktail. We, I mean, we can we can pontificate about that. What kind of cocktail we would put into the Space Force one? So I think we should just ask Steve Carroll. I think it should taste <laughs> as long as it doesn't taste like space ice cream. I'm good. Yeah, let's just uh, freeze dried and in a can. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, have you guys had much chance to experiment more? Do uh, you have any other like uh, secrets that you're working on or like, hey, down the road, this is our in the next two years. We want to have this 10 year bourbon that we're working on. We squirreled the barrel away. And we got eight barrels of the next generation profile, of a whole unique profile bourbon. Cool. Sitting there aging right now. They're five years, six years, five years, five years. Mm -hmm. They're five years, I think, November. Oh, wow. Next month. Um, and that was the first experiment with that. They are bourbon. Um, and uh, the flavor profile, we started again, like trying to lean into, you know, who we are, right? So we did some discovery on like, what were some of the grains that were important during the Roman Empire? Mm. And we found this grain called spelt, which is a wheat. Okay. And we didn't know it at the time that we chose it, but we chose it, it was very sweet. So we had to like, we, that what took us a couple, three, four or five recipe renditions to get that. So it wasn't too sweet, right? Yeah. Against the corn, against the multi barley, against everything. Um, but these, the, the, along the way, when we went to make our first like big batch run of it, we couldn't find spelled available in America in the quantities that we needed it, right? So it turns out that this is like never been messed with GMO. It's never been altered. So celiacs and uh, gluten intolerance can eat breads and pastas and stuff made from spelt. Wow. And it's wheat, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, it doesn't matter in distillation because honestly, um, you know, um, I mean, it, nothing survives distillation hardly, right? And, right. and, and, and certainly not, not uh, um, I'm drawing a blank. Glutens. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. sorry. Well, yeah, yeah, like well, and, and certain grains also didn't survive for certain millennia because of ergot, 
Right. And so that that also had some play as to why there's only very few of those things that are still resistant mm. or depending upon the seasons and where they're coming from based on the freeze and other things that goes into it. I'm not the most knowledgeable on the green side of the house in terms of that, but we it's kind of funny that it lined up perfectly to now because it is very like on trend and meta to like talk about Rome, which is very funny, but it, but, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but, but, but yeah, but we had a source of grain. They had a source of spelt from, uh, sorry, from uh, Germany. <laughs> right. Find it in the, enough to make even eight barrels. Wow. It was partly like, what would our ancient Roman empire do if they could build a bourbon? Yeah. Like kind of like that. But also at the same time, it, when we were making this, um, honey whiskey, and flavored whiskey started to become really popular. And um, Spelt has this really beautiful honey flavor. Like mm. if you've ever smelled it, it smells like honey. It smells exactly like honey wheat. It's really interesting, very floral and bright and sweet. And it, I think it'll be really like interesting to see how that, well, I mean, I know how it tastes like now, but, but <laughs> well, it, 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 it does. You know how it tastes at 124 proof, because that's how we've been saying and it. It, 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 tastes, it, it tasted like it, honey it, whiskey with no it's honey really added, which is really cool. I mean, it was smooth. It, two years and it's killer. smoother at three and smoother at four. And now it's just like, it's a, and I think like we've, we, got, really, we actually really made the labels, we made the labels and everything to like just the first barrel to do a barrel strength. Yeah. You know, we, and so we may do that, right? Just mm -hmm. to like, put, we have the labels, we have everything. We still like, like maybe like 150 to 250 bottles, barrel strength, limited release is what we're thinking probably. Yeah. Awesome. Right? So super yeah. exclusive. So we're going to a new product. Yeah. Super exclusive. And then we'll see like how we, like you know what their response is there and, and then go from there we'll probably still have you know sit five and a half six barrels left after that yeah we even know what was the name we came oh church burn church burn yeah. church, church burn. burn was you know oh. if you notice we're not necessarily like all that uh, <laughs> socially acceptable <laughs> no. I, I thought that, but, that the church burn was different that oh was, no the church burn was uh was, that, was, that, that was a different product that, that was yeah that's i'm sorry that is a that is a double barrel product that was a double barrel it was our it was our uh bourbon but aged in a spent honey habanero um porter Oh, and barrel. that uh, in that barrel, the bourbon, so. it was wow. honestly it was probably one of our most popular products, but it, it can't be repeated. Right. Of course. So the, the, like the, the fun part about having our old spot was we would just be like, all right, let's experiment. Today. Yeah, we got this. We we're talking these breweries. Oh, we, and we were just, you know, having fun. Yeah. Right? So it was we figure out a cocktail, get, get it off of our bar. People didn't want to buy the bottle, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So it was always there was always a distribution. Oh, channel. Man, that's the way to so get what, we did, what was the name we came up with? I thought it was like church honey or church? No, 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 no. no what was it no ancient grain ancient church no, ancient, like ancient, ancient grain was our code name when we were yeah ancient grain was yeah. the code name that's what we called it because uh, but i don't think we did we ever decide on it yeah we made labels so i know we did i'm not sure and it's all documented but i'm not sure that that can be right it's been, it's been probably three years since we made the labels and we just because of covid never released it right well, I will say, I don't know if you, uh, I, I only listen to death metal when I'm at the gym because it gets me going, but there's a, a, one of the original death metal bands, Mayhem. They became famous in Norway by burning churches. Their marketing scheme was to go around to burn churches. Oh, I did not know that. So if you need like some marketing play <laughs> with the original black metal death band. <laughs> I like it, dude. Mayhem. There's, there's a documentary out there with. Uh, well, maybe we'll change the name. <laughs> anyway. Well, this is awesome, guys. I appreciate you letting me uh, have some of your stuff. Um, I shamefully have not tried it before, and uh, I've seen it on the shelves at ABC since I've gone here. I haven't pulled the trigger yet. I know. Give me, if eyes could kill. <laughs> He's, he's about to set up a plug for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's great stuff. Um, are you is your distribution just in the area for now? Our distribution is so we we were in West Virginia and Pennsylvania and, and branching out into Maryland uh, from Virginia DC originally, but during COVID we just pulled back. Yeah, of course. So we're just in, we're really just we are still licensed in Maryland. Okay. Uh, both. Uh, um, you know, both sides of Maryland, you know, they're split with Montgomery County and then the rest of Maryland is two different kinds of styles of distribution, right? Yeah, and yeah. different licenses. We are licensed in both, um, but right now we're really just pushing DC and Virginia right yeah, now. That's fair. Well, I, I, I'll be honest, I have a lot of bourbon lovers who are out in the Midwest and out down south in North Carolina who uh, I'll, I'm definitely going to pick up a couple of bottles and share this with them because this is, this is great stuff. And I, it, and it, of course, like I said, it, it adds to the, the story that it's just a, a father son family team who's doing this cool you know, intimate, proud distillation. I love that. It, it makes it, I think it tastes better. So this has been great stuff. So well, I appreciate we appreciate 
you're finding us. Yeah. So taking the time to come interview you and give us our platform for yeah. the moment. So how, how did you find us? Uh, well, so of course going to ABC stores when I first moved here because Wisconsin is, you could go to CVS and buy liquor. Oh, that sounds laws. awesome. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's a wild west. Um, the, the trick is though, they're, the drunk driving is a little bit uh, more cracked down on. <laughs> but in, because uh, in Virginia, you can drive with open container if you're not the driver. In Wisconsin, you cannot do that. <laughs> you can't have an open, uh, you, have, you cannot have 29 Miller Lights in a, in, a, in a 30 rack in the back seat because they will assume that you drank it. So it, uh, it's a little trade-off. It's, it's the like, opposite of Texas. So yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like, <laughs> we were building the story. I was, uh, we were building the story at first and our first ones of batches of vodka. I was driving home one night through seven quarters and got pulled over by the, by the Falls Church Police Department and I reeked. <laughs> I mean, I rolled down my window and the guy was like, thought, you know, I was like just covered in vodka. I mean, I, was, I reeked, right? Yeah, it's I'm a distiller. <laughs> and and, and as we, we started talking and he goes, well, and he goes, oh, I've heard of this. Story. Like by the end of the conversation, he goes, yeah, you're way too much. You're way too loose. And yeah, you're good. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'll use that excuse next time I get pulled over. I'm a distiller. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I, 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 I saw tell them where you're coming from. <laughs> right. I saw, I saw your uh, bottle uh, of bourbon and whiskey in uh, a local ABC store. And I, I kept that in the back of my head and I've seen it before. And uh, I, I've kind of taken mental notes of all the local distilleries that I've, I've seen or been around to. And I, I've never been to the, the, the prior location you're talking about. But, um, and I just, when I started this podcast up and I'm like, I want to talk to local distilleries and I, I live in the Virginia area. So I'm, I have a pretty nice backlog of people I'm talking to and people in Wisconsin I've talked to and North Carolina, I have a couple lined up, but I, I, I'm like Falls Church, they have a, they have a distillery. So I, I did some Googling and I remembered uh, from uh, just my research back in the day that you were an Air Force veteran. I'm like, oh, cool. Well, hopefully he doesn't hate me. I'm in the army. <laughs> but, well, no, you were in the military. I was in the Air Force. <laughs> Good. We have that established. No, I'm kidding. I'm in the National yeah. Guard, though, so I'm, not, I'm also. It's all good. National Guard. We're all sitting in a chair currently. So. <laughs> but yeah, no. So I, I, I found it about that way, and I just, I just remembered. I was just, some kind of mental note popped up and said, "I'm going to hit them up." And I found your website and said, "Hey, maybe I'll just shoot an email." And here we are. Oh, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me here, and uh, thank you for the samples. I will be sure to check this out further, further, uh, bring some home to my friends and family to share with the bourbon lovers. Um, but uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Of Thank course. you. Cheers. Cheers. Salud. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate it if you left us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. The more reviews, the easier we are to find. Also, if you aren't already, be sure to follow us on social media so you never miss any of our updates. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and always be sure to drink responsibly. There are quite literally thousands of distilleries, so we're just getting started. Stay tuned for more conversations with master distillers, distillery owners, mixologists, and even bar owners, and more. Cheers. <laughs>